aging process, uh, you can describe it statistically in terms of uh, mortality uh, curves. And uh, what that means is that the probability of uh, dying increases uh, with your age. And the reason is that there's a degenerative process that's occurring in cells and tissues that makes uh, uh, you uh, increasingly less robust as you get older and uh, opens up the doors to diseases of aging, the major diseases, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and uh, you know, eventually will kill you. So uh, it's a very pervasive uh, uh, process that has many, many things going wrong all at the same time. Well, you're, you're talking to somebody who is uh, not unbiased uh, in this area. And, um, you know, I think the Sirtuins have really been, to my mind, uh, the a completely unexpected uh, new thing to come along. Now, this came from the studies in yeast that I described a few minutes ago, where we were looking for anti-aging genes. And after about nine years, of doing this, the first nine years, we started working in this area about 19 years ago. The first nine years were spent in yeast trying to find uh, the right gene, and we came upon a gene called SIR2. And the, the SIR2 gene was an anti-aging gene. And what I mean by that is when you made it more active, the cells lived longer. They divided more times. When you made it less active, they lived less long. So this looked like a really interesting gene, and it was the only gene that we came across that did this. And so, so we thought it was interesting. Then we carried out a similar kind of study uh, in a different organism that people study in the lab, the roundworm, C. elegans. And again, we're looking, are there any genes in the genome of C. elegans that are anti-aging genes? And we got the same gene. We got a gene that has the same sequence, similar sequence, as the yeast SIR2. So that's an amazing finding because what it means is if the SIR2 gene is counteracting aging in yeast and in worms, that it's doing that universally. And that would include mammals and it would include us. So it really right away speaks to a universality of this process. So I think that's one thing that's highly significant about this is that the gene is conserved and we think its effect on the aging process is conserved. Now, the piece of this that makes it, I think, particularly exciting is you say, well, okay, there's this gene uh, that uh, makes you live longer if it's more active. Why, why, why should that be? What does this gene actually do? Okay? And what we know is genes, of course, uh, are the blueprint to specify proteins, and the SIR2 genes encode particular proteins. The proteins are called sirtuins. okay? And we're really, really eager to try and figure out what the sirtuins actually did in cells. And just almost exactly 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, we discovered it. And they have an enzymatic activity in cells that enables them to modify other proteins in cells. And that can really change the metabolism, the physiology of a cell, and then by extension of entire tissues and an entire organism. But the critical thing about this activity is that it was completely coupled to this small metabolic molecule in cells called NAD. So the activity of sirtuins, which is called deacetylation of other proteins, is absolutely under control of NAD. No NAD, sirtuins are dead. Okay, so the NAD links sirtuins to diet and metabolism because diet and metabolism affect the availability of NAD in cells. So we came up with a hypothesis 10 years ago when we discovered this activity that sirtuins might be, really be the link between how diet affects how long you live and how diet affects 
your predisposition to diseases. And this is a, it was a, uh, I think, a radical uh, idea. I think there are a lot of people out there still critical, don't believe it. Um, but I think the data is mounting, in mice particularly, that says that this may actually be true. And so the idea would be uh, that on a low calorie diet, a diet that's been termed calorie restriction, we know that rodents live longer and they resist diseases. They're disease free under this diet. And we suggest that the reason for that, at least one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, is that this low calorie diet activates sirtuins via this molecule NAD. And that the more active sirtuins uh, then promote better survival and better ability to ward off diseases. So that's a very simple uh, hypothesis that came from identifying this activity that I, I mentioned. So that's one. Second the second thing that came out of that is once you have an understanding of what a protein does, and you can actually measure that in a test tube now that just has that protein, and in this case NAD, it enables you to screen for drugs for small molecules that can enhance that activity. And it opened the door for looking for small molecules that could upregulate the activity of sirtuins. And that's led to sort of a, a flood. Of, uh, uh, of interest. I think probably the part of the story that's gotten the greatest notice in the press. So the first uh, screens that were done identified a molecule uh, found in red wine called resveratrol that's of a class of uh, compounds that plants make in response to stress. They're called polyphenols. And these compounds could activate uh, the sirtuin in a test tube and they also could make cells live longer, yeast cells, and could make worms live longer. So the remarkable thing uh, seemed to be that not only are sirtuins able to do this, but we might actually be able to influence their activity uh, from outside with drugs. And that really is, uh, I think, where the uh, excitement began and is still uh, building because I think that this is still not completely appreciated yet. So. That was, these are natural products, the resveratrol and uh, the polyphenols, the things that are found in wine. But a company was started uh, by uh, David Sinclair and Christoph Westfall called Sertris about uh, six years ago to try and look for new kinds of molecules now that are not uh, natural products, they're not found in nature, by screening through libraries of different chemical compounds that have been synthesized. And there are new kinds of activators now of sirtuins, new chemicals, that can activate them much more potently than resveratrol. And it's going to be extremely exciting to test these molecules and see what they'll do. So far what we know is both resveratrol and some of these newer compounds uh, have beneficial effects in mice. And what they do in mice, they've been tested against uh, various diseases. So what we would expect is if these molecules are really activating sirtuins and can protect against diseases of aging, then we should be able to demonstrate that in a mouse. So it turns out if you feed a mouse uh, basically a bad diet, the opposite of a calorie restricted diet, so a diet high in fat, high in calories, the mice get diabetes. Okay? Now it turns out these molecules, resveratrol and the newer compounds that activate the sirtuins they can protect the mouse against diabetes. So the mouse will still eat a lot. The mouse will still even get fat, okay? But will stay metabolically healthy. So that's a pretty good demonstration that uh, uh, this idea is not so far out, uh, but that there really is an opportunity here to use drugs to keep metabolism strong and intact as in the face of uh, uh, caloric excess, okay? But even more importantly, for many of us, like myself, who already, uh, I don't calorie restrict, but I don't eat to excess either, so I'm in good shape. But even someone like myself would be able to get benefit from these, uh, these molecules by activating sirtuins, in addition to the benefit that I'm already getting by keeping myself in good shape. So I think it's, very, uh, uh, it's a very promising area of research and this company, uh, this small company called Sertris, was 
uh, bought by one of the giants in the pharmaceutical industry, GSK, for something like three quarters of a billion dollars a year ago. So obviously that uh, uh, there's at least some uh, uh, validation in big pharma that these ideas uh, are uh, realistic and will be brought to fruition. Well, I think we, well, you know, my lab works on really on sirtuins, and I think there's so much to be done. So what we know now is just a, a, the tip of the iceberg about sirtuins. So first of all, there are seven of them in people, okay, and so far most of the studies have been focused on just one of those seven. Second of all, there are many tissues that have to be studied, so we know what the sirtuins are doing in each and every tissue, so that we know what the effects of a drug are going to be tissue by tissue. Uh, and that's going to take a long time, so we're deeply involved in that. The third thing is, will these sirtuins really protect against many diseases, or will they just protect against metabolic diseases like diabetes? So my lab is really focus, focused now on neurodegenerative diseases, and we're testing the effect of activating uh, the, the major uh, human sirtuin, which is called SIRT1, which has also been called the survival gene. Uh, and we're interested in, what if we activate this in the brain? Will it protect a mouse against Alzheimer's disease, against Parkinson's disease, against Huntington's disease? And I think these are extremely important questions because they'll define the scope of uh, uh, what we're able to think about here and what we can uh, start to attack pharmacologically.